reading to the epistle, 3 John. That's toward the end of the New Testament. Uh, Just this week, my son-in-law sent me an article out of the Harvard Business Review. I'm so glad I got a kid that reads the Harvard Business Review. My son-in-law sent me an article this week from the Harvard Business Review. And uh, doesn't that sound impressive? Uh, Now, it's not a conservative publication. I can promise you that. (laughs) It's a liberal northeastern publication. But they carried an article that was fascinating about what's going on right now as a result of COVID in America. It may explain a lot of things. The article was entitled, The The Great Resignation. Just listen to the opening statement. The great resignation keeps growing before our eyes. Every month, the ranks of those who have resigned swell more and more. Nearly 57 million Americans quit between January 2021 and February 2022. They quit their job. They just walked off their jobs. Many companies seem to be struggling for answers in the face of this skyrocketing attrition rate. They don't know what to do. Uh, I I don't know if you've experienced it or not. Everywhere I go is looking for somebody to work. They're looking, you know, we're we're hired. You know, the hire sign is out everywhere. And I've been in many places where uh, these owners of small companies tell me, I can't keep on like this. I can't get any help. Nobody wants to work. I can't, you know, all of my help. I've had several of them tell me we had people working and they simply walked out one day. We've never heard from them again. We don't know where they are. We don't know what to do. Uh, And the article, now listen, (laughs) the Harvard Business Review said that the problem of all of this resignation, we just give up, we quit, we walk away from whatever it is, is a lack of purpose in life. Now, I, that shocks me that Harvard Business Review would say that, a lack of purpose in life. You want to ask Harvard, well, what's the answer? Well, uh, I doubt they could give you the answer, uh, but let me tell I can give you the answer, and it's Jesus Christ. In the same week that that article came out, I can't remember if it was Barner or Gallup, But one of the polls came out and said for the first time since they've been keeping track of how many Americans are in church, it is now below 50%. And I just asked the question, does anybody put this stuff together? Does anybody ever see any reason that there's a growing lack of purpose in life and people going to church less? And not just church. But also this week, and this was from Gallup, they came out with a poll that stated that only 20 to 27% of Americans actually believe in the Word of God, that the Word of God is actually the Word of God. Only 20 to 27%. And again, I come back and say, are you, does it shock you that our nation is suffering in the midst of the great resignation? Now, that's what the Harvard Business Review calls it, the great resignation, Are you shocked that we're going through that when people are in church less and less and believe the Word of God is not the Word of God? Doesn't surprise me at all. And as I thought about that, I thought to myself, I think that the opposite of purposelessness is faithfulness. That when there is a sense of faithfulness, you have a sense of purpose. Now, we're in a series on these hot summers um, Sunday summers, su- summer Sundays, and it's hot. Um, that's all I know. It's just hot. We had a guy here in the last service. He says, I come here half the year. And he says, I go back to Oklahoma the other half of the year. And I said, why? Is it not hot enough here for you? So, well, anyway, you'd have had to live out there if you knew it. When I moved to Texas, we, they had 100 days of 100 plus degree temperature. Flies would just fall dead out of the, you watch fly just drop like that. It would be so hot. Anyway, Faithfulness, it is one of the fruits uh, or the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, it is uh, what we're going to look at. So put your finger in First John, right, in Third John right there and go with me back to Galatians where Paul is talking about this. He's talking about this whole concept of faithfulness really throughout the little epistle of Galatians. He comes in chapter 5 and verse 22, and he says, "...the fruit of the Spirit, which I've called the fruit of revival." That is, these things are to be evident 
All of these things are to be evident in every believer's life because of the presence of Christ in your life who is bearing these, uh, who is producing these, and we bear these, these fruit of the Spirit. There is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, we've got two more that are coming up. But this morning, I want you to look at this because Paul has called the churches in Galatia to account for their lack of faithfulness. They walked away from the Word of God. Look in chapter 1, verse 6. He talks about it right there. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. He says, you've walked away from the gospel that you trusted in, in Jesus Christ. You, you walked away from that. It's no longer a part. You, you've come to devise a different gospel. Now, I want to tell you, that's more a reality in the evangelical church today than we realize. I, I think back to the faith uh, that uh, I, I, I was won by and won to in Jesus Christ, and today we've, we've morphed. We've evolved into a gospel that suits my lifestyle better than the gospel of Jesus Christ that saved me. Okay. I told the last crowd, listen, if I don't get it, we'll be here a little bit longer, but I, I can amen myself. Let me, let me show you the second thing that he comes to here, and that is that there was a lack of faithfulness to each other. Look in chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 26 where Paul pleads with them. He says, let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. I hate to say it, but that goes on in the church more than we realize. This boasting about who we are, boasting about, you know, our spiritual depth and maturity, our challenging each other, our envying, wanting what each other has. He, he comes and he says, you, you've, you've, you've absolutely walked away from your faithfulness to each other. And then he comes and he talks about the, the church as a whole in chapter 6 and verse 10. He says, let's don't, let's don't lose heart in doing good. Don't give up this thing. Be faithful through all of this. So then, while we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. So he looks at that, and the interesting thing to me is when you come to 3 John, the third epistle of John, John writes this to an individual. His name is Gaius, and he writes this. There's, of course, first, the first epistle of John, the second epistle. Some believe that John wrote 2 John and 3 John at the same time. He sent 2 John to the church and 3 John to Gaius. Now, I happen to believe, before I get into the text here, uh, I happen to believe that Gaius was the pastor and the church was in his home. Uh, they didn't have church buildings. They didn't have Valleydale like this. They, had, they met in homes. And so I think he was the pastor of a house church. And I think John's writing him to encourage him in the midst of faithlessness. And I'm going to show you that as we get into 3 John. But before we get there, I, I've done this with e every one of these fruits of the Spirit. I've gone back to show you where do you see this in the Word of God? Where do you see this in Christ? Where do you see this in God himself? Faithfulness is a very distinctive characteristic of God. Now watch this. I'm going to give you five things. Don't turn to these passages. I'm just going to give them to you. You can write them down if you've got a pen and a piece of paper. Number one, his word is faithful. The word of God is faithful. Psalm 119.86, all thy commandments are faithful. Number two, his faithfulness is faithful. Lamentations 3.23, great is thy faithfulness. Number three, he is faithful in times of temptation. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He is faithful in the midst of temptation. Number four, he is faithful to forgive. If, if, you, if you walk on into temptation, listen, he's faithful to forgive you. You can find forgiveness, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful faithful to forgive us. And number five, listen to this. He is faithful even when we're not. When I do walk into sin, he will forgive me. But let me tell you, when I am faithless, he is still faithful. First Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. 
Amen for that is right. Now, here's the, and listen, beyond that, if you want to go to Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus Christ comes back, as John sees that, in Revelation chapter 19, he comes back, and what's his name? He has a name written on him, faithful and true. He is a faithful God. Jesus is a faithful Savior. Now, here is the issue. The issue is this. Are we expressing, are we exhibiting the faithfulness of God through our lives to show the world that our God is faithful? Are we showing the next generation? Are we exhibiting the faithfulness of God through our lives, this characteristic of God? Are we showing this faithfulness through our lives to the next generation so that our children that are coming up behind us, uh, they will understand and know what faithfulness is? Now, let me tell you up front, if we're not showing faithfulness, how in the world can we expect the world to know what it is? Why is, why is it any surprise that there's not this great resignation? Mainly because the church is not living out the faithfulness of God in the midst of this country. We're here as salt, folks. We're just sprinkled sparsely throughout this country. We should be the ones who are not resigning. We should be the people who know how to be faithful. Because we have a faithful God who has been incredibly faithful to us. So I'm not just resigning and giving up and walking away. I'm not going to walk away on my wife. I'm not going to walk away on my family. I'm not going to walk away on this or that or the other. I'm not going to walk away on my job. I'm not going to walk away from what God's called me to do. I'm not going to walk away from earning a living to support my family. I'm not going to walk away from all the things that people are walking away from today. Why? Because I know and have seen the faithfulness of God in my life. And listen, b beyond that, that brings purpose. You have a great sense of purpose in whatever you do if you're being faithful to Christ in your personal life so that your work is an act of worship to Him. You go to service. Every, do you know that? All of you lay people, you are supposed to be going to worship every single Monday morning. What do you call it? You say, well, where am I supposed to go? To work. It's an act of worship to Almighty God. Be faithful in doing that. Be faithful to your employer. Be faithful to the guy that hired you or the lady that hired you. Do a faithful day's work for them. Well, if we don't show that to our children, you say, well, now how do we do that? Well, let me just give you three quick things out of uh, 3 John this morning. Number one, we, we must show and should be faithful to doctrinal purity. Now listen to what he says beginning in verse 1, the third epistle of John, the elder, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now there are about four different guys in the New Testament called Gaius. There's a guy over in the 19th chapter of Acts, I believe he's in Macedonia. There's a guy in the 20th chapter of Acts, I believe he's in Derby. Uh, there is uh, the guy that Paul baptized over in 1 Corinthians called Gaius, and then this guy. And I just tell you that. Don't confuse them. These are different. That was a, po it was a popular name. And, and so here's a guy there who I think was head of a house church that met in his home. And John, the great apostle, the last one living probably at this time, he was the last one living. This was written into the 90s the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now just listen to this. Uh, the same passage that Chris just read. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper, be in good health just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren came, testified to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now is there some word that you just, you kept hearing through that whole thing? Truth. Four times, four verses, truth, 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 truth. He's talking about truth. <laughs> now, let me tell you, what does John mean when he uses the word truth? Because this isn't some goofy interview with people on the street. Well, my truth is this. Your truth is, <laughs> I can just tell you. My truth is, <laughs> this is the truth right here. This is the only truth that there is. Everybody can walk around and talk about their truth. What John refers to here in the epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, his concept of truth is always doctrinal purity. 
That's what he's referring to. He's referring literally to the Word of God. This is truth. Now, let me show you that with Paul. Just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for a minute. And let me show you what may be one of the best uh, expressions of truth or the Word of God you'll come across. Uh, Paul is talking to the church uh, there in Corinth. And he said, when I came to you, he said, I didn't come to you with superiority of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ, him crucified. So he's talking about the gospel. Now, where did the gospel come from? Uh, This wisdom, which none of the rulers of this age has understood, that's verse 8, this wisdom, what's the wisdom? The gospel, which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew what the gospel was, if they understood what God was doing, they would have recognized Jesus Christ as Messiah, but they didn't uh, because they don't have any. The wisdom of this age is not the wisdom of God. Verse 10, for to us God revealed them. Through the Spirit. Now he's referring to the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? You say, now what is he talking about? Well, John Bagwell right there. Nobody knows what's going through John Bagwell's mind right now. Not even his wife. She knows him better than anybody. She doesn't even know what's going through his mind. Only John knows. That's what he's saying. Only each man, each woman, nobody knows what's going through my mind right now except for me. So that's what he's saying. Then he says this, but, he says, watch this, the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, that spirit, the spirit of God knows the mind of God. The Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. He knows what the what the mind of God is thinking, what the mind of God is all about. We've received that spirit, not the spirit of the world, verse 12, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us. by. I can know the thoughts of God. I can know some of the mind of God. How? Which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. I can know it through this word right here. Because the words in this book, all 66 of these books, the word in this book right here is spiritual thoughts of God taken by the Spirit of God and put into human language. Now that is an amazing thought that a God who is so infinite and so far above us that if he spoke, I'm on the... uh, I'm a trustee for the Institute of Creation Research, and uh, I, I go to trustee meetings down there, and they bring in all of these, and it's so exciting. It is so exciting to see. We've got a guy from Harvard in genetics, and we've got a guy from Boulder, Colorado, University of Colorado, Boulder, who is a, a, an astrophysicist, and they come in, and they tell us about all their research that they're doing, and I want to tell you, I don't have a clue what they're talking about it's so up here it's just going it's just passing over my head like crazy and I'm thinking what is this guy saying but I sit there like this yeah I'm just you know hey look it you look at least like you got some sense but I have I do not I'll be honest with you I have to go I used to go up after before I buried Dr. Morris he passed away of COVID I used to go up to him after I said Dr. Morris please tell me what that guy just said and he would share I was his pastor at one time and he, he, he's safe to tell him, I don't know what he's talking about. And he'd laugh he, he, back. He said, I don't know a lot of it. But he would explain a little bit of it. Well, listen, God, what, what do you think? If a guy out of Boulder, Colorado, with a degree in astrophysics, get up and talks over your head, don't you suppose God who gave him that brain could really talk over your head? Well, he doesn't. He gives us the Word. That's the miracle of the Word of God right there, is that He gives us this Word. The question is this, am I faithful to the Word that God has given me? Do I take it as His Word? Do I put my trust and my faith in it? 
Now, you can argue with the Word of God all day long, and I want to tell you, you can be proud of yourself because there are a lot of people out there, mainly in universities, who are proud of themselves because they argue with the Word of God. But I can tell you this, at the end of the day, it is going to have the last say on every single life. Son, I could be Pentecostal right now. I'm telling you, that, that just... He comes, and that's what he says. Listen, there has got to be in our lives this faithfulness to doctrinal purity, to the Word of God. Let me give you the second thing quickly. And the second thing is this. We're to be faithful to one another. Now, the first four verses, he talks about this faithfulness to truth. And then he comes in verse 5, and look at what he does here now. He comes, and he's going to talk about faithfulness to each other. Beloved, you are acting, now he's speaking to Gaius. So when he says beloved, you can put in Gaius there. He's just, it's just a little pet pastor's name for one of his staff members. Beloved, that's what I call Kirkwood. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about how Gaius treated these missionaries, these itinerant pastors that showed up and needed some food and a place to stay and some money. There were two groups that were going out. There were two groups that were out that were infiltrating the church and having an impact. You, you'll read some about it in Colossians. you read about it uh, in First and Second uh, um, John as well. In fact, look at Second John. Mine's just across the page. Look at Second John verse 7. And you see these that had gone out. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished. He said, don't do what the Galatians have done and swap out or just morph into a different gospel. He said, you hold on to it. Don't lose what we've accomplished, all the ground that you have made so that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Then the one who abides in his teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So he comes right here and he says, listen, there are these groups of people that are going out and they're infiltrating the churches and they're getting in and they're becoming teachers and they're teaching. He's referring to the Gnostics who did not believe that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. That's why he says this back up there in verse 7. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. The the Gnostics didn't. They believed that he was an emanation. from Out of uh, the light of God, they believed that these emanations came. And the first and great emanation was Christ. And then you come to special angels, and then lower angels, and you come on down, and you come on down, and come on down. Now, there's a Greek word for that, and it's called baloney. But that was a not, it was very impressive. It had all of this mysticism, and all of this mystery, and it had secret handshakes, and secret this and secret that, and you had to be part of their little club if you were going to get the secrets. And everybody wanted to be part of that because it seemed to make you a a more spiritual Christian than just the average people who believe that Jesus came in the flesh. It was heresy is what it was. And so he comes and he says, you've got these two groups. Now there's the other group. Go back to 3 John. Look at verse 7 there. In 3 John verse 7, he says, for they went out for the sake of the name. That's all he says about them. He said, they went out for the sake of uh, of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. In other words, there were these itinerant missionaries, these itinerant pastors who went out, and uh, they would preach the gospel and share the gospel with the Gentiles and share Jesus Christ with them, but would not accept anything from them, wouldn't take an honorarium, wouldn't take a check, wouldn't take a love offering, wouldn't take any of that because they wanted to be credible. They wanted to, we're not here for the sake of the money. We're here for the sake of your soul. We're here for the sake of the gospel. Every time I think of that, my wife says, here's your historical moment. You remember John Knox? Y'all remember John Knox? You know who John Knox was? The great uh, reform preacher in Scotland during the time of Mary, Queen of Scots. 
he used to go and bang on the castle door where she lived. And they would send word, Mary, Queen of Scots, wants to know what you want here, John Knox. He said, you tell that woman I've come to require of her soul. That's what they did. They went out and required men of their soul. Where are you? Do you know Christ? Then we share the gospel with you. And so they would share the gospel and they wouldn't take anything. And so that's why John says to Gaius, thank you. I know these folks. You don't know them. They're strangers to you. But they came to you from preaching the gospel. They needed somewhere to stay and something to eat. And they needed a little money to get on to their next place or assignment. All they had was to go to the church of Jesus Christ and trust that the people there would be their brothers and sisters in Christ, would be their friends. Now, that's what, that's what he's saying here. Be faithful to one another. I fear that has faded to a great extent in the church. I want to just read to you a couple of passages. I'm just going to read to you a couple of them out of Proverbs. Go to Proverbs 27 and listen to what Solomon writes in Proverbs 27, verse 10. He says, do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend. Now, I thought about that when I read this. My dad's friends. I remember the men that my dad was friends with. Every one of them were strong Christian believers. Uh, And I thought about how they had impacted my life. Do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. What that simply means is this, is listen, (laughs) in a moment of calamity, you don't have time for your brother who lives over in Texas to get here. You should have built a relationship with the guy next door. So he says it is better to have a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Have you built that kind of relationship? Have you invested in that kind of relationship? Just look at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 19. This is a great verse. Like a bad tooth or an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in a time of trouble. Do you understand what he's saying in that? You ever had an abscess tooth? When I was in college, I came home for Thanksgiving, and um, I had a tooth that had abscessed. And I had to call my dentist. Now, I'd been to this guy since I was 10 years old, to this dentist. And now I'm 19. I guess I was 19. Yeah, 19, somewhere in there. Anyway, I had to call him on Thanksgiving morning and say, hey, Dr. Abel, I've got a terrible toothache. Would you, would you please, could you look at it? Could you see it? And he said, sure. He said, I'll meet you at the office. And I'd known that man really all of my life, Dr. Abel. What a great guy he was. Great, great guy. Great Christian uh, dentist, and he met me down there. You know what? When you have a need like that, and you, somebody tells you, oh, well, the only person you can call is so-and-so, and you know them to be faithless, what do you do? You go, oh, my aching back. They'll never come through. They never come through. They are never any help. So he says it's just like that when you have nobody that's really faithful to you. You've never built that faithful relationship let, let, just listen on. You know, Solomon gives us some pretty good advice here. He comes in chapter 20 of Proverbs, verse 6. Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? Everybody I know runs around talking about how loyal they are, but I want to tell you something. I don't know if they're really trustworthy or not. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I don't know if you've been there, but Lord, I have. Listen to this, Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. What all of that is saying is what John is saying back here, and it is this, invest in your relationships. Invest in your friendships. Build into that. Pour into that. And I'm afraid we don't do that in the church anymore. We scoot by one another because we're in such a hurry and we've got such a jam-packed schedule and we never stop long enough to find out about somebody else's life and what's going on and just be a friend to them. You know, last week I talked an awful lot about American history. You know, the founding documents of this country are fading. 
I don't know if you, 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 you ever read anything. I read an article on that not long ago, uh, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. They're all fading. When uh, Jefferson wrote the in, uh, Declaration of Independence, what they did with that, with that original document, is once it dried, because he's using ink, is they would take and they would put a thin layer of water over that ink and a clean piece of paper, and they would press that down on that clean piece of paper so that it would copy. When you pulled it off, it would copy. There was your copy right there. Well, what they were doing was they were deteriorating the ink on the original copy so that the original copies and the copies are all now fading away. So they've got them in these special glass cases, you know, ultraviolet glass on it to keep ultraviolet light out so that it won't fade from the light. In this uh, vacuum free, this va air free vacuumed, you know, case so that they don't fade because they're fading. I fear that in the church, one of the greatest things about the church is that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't even call each other that anymore. It's an embarrassment if you're out somewhere and somebody says, hey, brother, you know, or hey, sister, or something like that. We, we, don't, we don't invest in our friendships anymore. And it's beginning to fade. And we're not teaching our children in the next generation how valuable friendships are. You know, when I was growing up, the phone would ring 20, 30 times until I started dating her. It would ring, it ring 20 or 30 times. Everybody, you'd fuss, you'd fight it. I, I am not getting that phone. I got it the last time. You let one of these halfway go off, and we're jumping out of our skin to grab it. We used to have relationship. I didn't want to talk on the phone. I wanted to talk to the people who were there. It was a different day. It was a different time. We invested in our friendships. Some of you here are desperate for somebody to invest in you. You're longing for that. We ought to be faithful to one another. You know what I just read you a few moments ago, especially to the household of faith? There should be a faithfulness among us in this place to one another. Not that we are not faithful to other people, but we ought to be born down deep faithful to each other here. That if you're a part of Valleydale, you got a friend. you got a church full of friends. And they care about you and they love you. And they're concerned for you. Let me give you the last thing. And the last thing is this, is there needs to be a faithfulness. We need to live out of faithfulness to the church. I've already shared with you that less than half the population in America, listen, that was unthinkable <laughs> just a number of years ago, that less than half the population in the country now go to church. But look at what he says. He comes and he talks about this. Verse 6, he, mention, he mentions the church, that these missionaries have testified to your love before the church that here are these missionaries, these strangers that you, you put them up and you fed them and you gave them money to go on their way, they are testifying in other churches now about your love and about the love of your church. That, li listen, let me tell you something. That spreads through a city. When a church becomes known as a place of genuine fellowship, all the other churches start talking about it. Man, that's where you want to go. That's where it's happening uh, that's where you're really going to find a, a, a relationship. That's where you're going to find faithfulness. People will talk about that. But look at what he does. Now, this epistle has three people that are mentioned. And the three people are as two are alike and one is different. He's giving you an illustration now of the church. What is the church like? Well, John writes and he says, I wrote something to the church, but thou trephes. Now, this guy, he's a piece of work. This is the negative here. He's the guy that's in the church that's always negative, that's always upset, that's always complaintive, that's never happy, uh, that wants to be the head of every committee, and uh, he doesn't want to listen to another So Now, we're not talking about Mac Brunson writing a letter. We're talking about the Apostle John writing, and John, the apostle, the one who leaned on the on the arm of Jesus at the Last Supper is writing this, and he says, Dow Trephes, he won't listen to a thing we say. 
What's the problem with this guy? Well, look, in the Greek text, this comes first. In fact, it's called an articular present participle. The articular is the, um, is the definite article, and it states this, the one who loves to be first. <laughs> it gives you all you need to know. He, he, listen, he, this is the guy who thinks everybody else should listen to what he has to say and never question it and just do it. But Dow Trephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Will not listen to the apostle. Disagrees. Now, verse 10, you go home and you read verse 10. There are three clauses there, and it'll give you three clauses of what this guy does. He thinks he runs the place. And in fact, he tries to run the place. Now, there's that picture of the church. Now, listen to verse 11. And I'll close very quickly here. My time is done. Verse 11 is the main verb of all 15 verses. This is the main idea right here. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. He's talking to the church. Beloved, do not imitate. He's just talked about diotrephes. Do not imitate that jerk. Now that, listen, that's a loose translation, but you get the idea. You don't imitate people like that. You don't do what they're doing. Don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Now he comes to Demetrius. With this verse in between the two, he has received a good testimony. John says, that guy Demetrius you got there, now he's, he, he's the real deal. He's for real. That's the guy you can put your confidence in. That's the guy who is faithful. This is a guy that everybody can look at him from everyone. A good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. Even the truth itself testifies of Demetrius. You know what he's saying is this, is you can watch the guy's life and what he does is truthful, faithful. What he does is faithful. And John says, I'll just add to that. We add our testimony to the testimony of this guy. He is a faithful guy. Now, there's your church right there. That everything's wrong. Everything's an upset. Everything's a problem. Nobody's listening to me. Nobody's putting me in charge of everything. You know, that, that right there. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to be happy with anything unless I'm running it. And then you've got this other guy over here, Demetrius. And this is the guy who is faithful. He's faithful to his brothers and sisters in Christ. He is faithful to the church. He is faithful to the Word of God. You know, we admire that in people. We, we, we admire that in people, but we really admire it whenever we find faithfulness but, because we don't find a lot of faithfulness. We don't find a lot of loyalty. They first saw him at the St. Clair Hospital in Fort Benton, Montana. It was a dog. It was a dog that had belonged to a shepherd who the shepherd had fallen ill in the field, had gotten sick, fell down, and the dog, now this is not a Lassie story. What is it, Lassie? What is it? You know, oh, Timmy fell in the well. No, it's not, a, it's not a that. But the dog was there, and the dog alerted people that his master had fallen, that he was sick. And they came, and they picked the guy up, and they put him in the car, and they took him down to the St. Clair Hospital. And they say that the dog ran the entire way behind the car to the hospital. They took him in, tragically and sadly, the man did not live. He died. And as they brought his body out, because his family, we've lost the guy's name. We don't know who the guy, but his family said, would you please send him east and we will pay for the expenses uh, so that we can bury him back here, back east with his family. They said as they rolled him out of the hospital that the dog followed him all the way down to the train station. This is 1936 said when they, on the platform, rolled the casket into that uh, car that they put it in and shut the door, they said the dog just sat there and pawed at the door and whimpered. The train took off and left. The dog never did. 
They said that the dog would go up under the bench there on the platform at the station until a train would come in. said every train that came in, that dog would run out from under the bench and go and stand at the door and sniff and look at everybody that came off waiting for the master to come back. The people there at the train station began to feed the dog. They took care of him. They put food and water out from him uh, for the dog, and the dog was there for nearly six years. And the dog got old and lost its hearing, and tragically, one day, the dog stepped onto the railroad track looking for the train, and a train came from the opposite direction and hit and killed the dog. They'd named him Shep. And in 1992 or 94, they put up this bronze monument to Shep there on the Missouri River. (laughs) Can you imagine that? Putting that up on the Missouri River that looks down over toward the train station. That when the dog died, they said the whole town turned out to bury the dog. Do you know why? Look right there. Shep, forever faithful. We admire. We stand in awe. It's almost an emotional experience to see the faithfulness. I saw an article this morning. It's amazing to me how I get these things. I saw an article this morning. This guy was on crutches, had his right leg was in a cast all the way up to here. He was walking into his house, and his dog was walking beside him, and the dog was limping. And they tell the story that the man had just taken the dog to the vet and spent $400 to find out while the dog was limping, and the vet told him he's limping because he's in sympathy with you. Nothing wrong with his leg. You look at that and you think to yourself, a dog is more faithful than I've been to a Savior. Let's stand. Some of you here, in speaking of faithfulness, you've never put your faith, first of all, in Jesus Christ. Your faith has been in a lot of things, but it's not been in Jesus Christ. And this morning, I'm calling you to Christ. I'm calling you to the one who's been faithful to you, even when you've been unfaithful. The one who is faithful and just to forgive you all of your unrighteousness, your sin. The one who speaks to you a faithful word. You can trust the word of God, I promise you. There's going to come a moment in your life where you're going to be somewhere on your own and you're going to look for one thing and that is you're going to look for somebody that would be faithful, truthful, loyal to you. Jesus Christ is. He always has been. He always will be question this morning is, is have you put your faith in Him? If you've never done that in this moment, you can simply pray and invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. You can confess your sin to Him. You can ask for His forgiveness. I've said it now three times. He's faithful to forgive you of your sin. He will be faithful to be Lord of your life. Just put your trust in Him. To as many as believed on Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. Others of you here this morning, listen, God feeds you in this place on a regular basis. You're in a life group. You're here in worship. You move among this fellowship. This is one of the warmest fellowships you'll ever experience anywhere in this country. Not just this city, but anywhere in this country. One of the warmest, caringest fellowships that you will ever experience anywhere. I invite you, come and be a part of it. Come and join us and help us as we try to care and express the love of Jesus Christ to everybody that comes into this place. Father, in these moments, only you care for us to the degree that you do. Only you care for us enough to love us, to die for us, to be raised, to give us eternal life. Only you, Father, love us the way you do. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the faithfulness of your love. 
for we pray it in Jesus' name. Just with your heads bowed right now, if God's speaking to your heart, why not respond to this, this Savior who has been so faithful to you? You come as God speaks.